itself. That's hard coded in one of the libraries. You know, for an external reset. Yes. yes. Burning full power. Running full clock speed, right. burning full power. Okay. So you could actually take that while loop out of there. And it would, you, yeah, you could run one straight through, and, and then it would just stop. No, 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 no. It wouldn't, no. It wouldn't, it would go into its own little the behind the oh, scenes little okay. loop that you don't see and not do any useful Got work it. Got it. forever from power until you cycle the power. Or you got an external interrupt and you had previously set up interrupts and enabled interrupts, and which is not hard to do. So it doesn't go into a low power stop state then? Not by itself, but you, you can, can to. but you can tell it to. Okay. And it has multiple levels of, of uh, sleep. It actually has a sleep instruction uh, that there's a library for. Uh, and with, I with a timer? I'm sorry? With a timer or with... No, nope. no, no. It just it puts the CPU to sleep. It shuts down the clock mm -hmm. to the CPU. And there, like I said, there's different levels. Like if you had a timer, for example, running in the background, uh, like I do on this one, and once I get done figuring out whether there's a cliff or not, I've got... 13, 14 milliseconds to wait before anything you know happens again. I just put it to sleep. Now I don't turn that timer off because the timer needs to run and be generating the pulses for this, but the CPU can just shut down. It goes to sleep and then when it wakes up, it resumes from wherever it was. Um, uh, I brought a copy I, and I've mailed it to the list this morning. I don't know if anybody happened to see it, but the source code for my version, which is uh, of necessity truncated because I didn't have a Tiny 85 to, to build the, the full-fledged you know, Wanderer that actually goes in a straight line and stays on the table. Uh, but I've got it down to four pages, uh, and you're you know, welcome to take a look at it. Uh, and that's got motor driver functions, um, uh, the LED functions, the, and the interrupt, and how to set up an interrupt and um, uh, have it execute every once in a while. It should be it's not obvious how it works, but when, when, if you take a look at the code, it's not, it's not hard. Uh, and once you learn how to do one interrupt, then you'll find out how to do some of the other. And there, like, there's 11 interrupt sources in this chip, things that can stop the program in its tracks and make it go do something else and handle it, and then come back and the program never knows it was not you know, continuously running. But that's all there is to blinking an LED, then by extrapolation, yes. So we're kind of talked around the edges of both interrupts and timers, but could you, you know, eliminate the, the for loops for timing and actually have it come back and give you an interrupt after? Yes, yes, you can set up previous to entering the while loop um, a timer uh, that said after so much time, you know, and you can you have the, the timer peripheral is fairly sophisticated. It has a prescaler for the system clock, so you don't have to just count individual clock cycles because it's only a, an 8-bit timer. You think, well, 256 clock cycles, you know, it's going to overflow. Mm -hmm. Well, you can prescale that by up to 1,024. So you can get a lot of time in there and say, well, when that happens, I want you to quit blinking the LED. I don't want you to then go do something else. I want to blink the LED really fast for a few seconds and then come back. Uh, so yes, you could, you could definitely do that. Uh, and to set up the timer, you have to read the data sheet. Okay, the library function, there are library functions to do it, but each chip is a little bit different. So you might as well do what the chip yeah, says. Because, <laughs> because by the time you figure out how to use that library function for your chip, you've already learned how to set up the registers. I, there's usually only like two or three registers you have to set up anyway. And that's done in this, this listing. I, uh, I mailed it to the uh, mailing list this morning before I came. It will eventually get put into the SVN repository for this project as an alternative firmware, uh, simplified, you know, for you know, educational purposes. Um, Which reminds me, the, the, um, the, the current code in that one and also the circuit, and circuit schematic and the PCB design and um, the bill of materials are all in and the, the DPIG's SVN repository, and uh, I'll get, I forgot to put that in the slide set, but I'll get it added. But that's all available on our website, and we'll give you links to all that if, mm -hmm. if anybody's interested in it. Um, so, uh, something you'll notice, you have a main function, 
you do any sort of initialization that needs to be done. Here it was, you know, a single um, statement. And then you go into a while loop. So you initialize and then you loop forever. Uh, that's the nature of embedded programming. You know, once it comes up, now, once it comes up out of reset, there could be several reasons for that. A, you just changed the battery. B, there was a catastrophic failure and you lost power. C, you know, you just, it's, it just got turned on and that's supposed to happen. It doesn't matter. Depends on your application. If it's a heart lung machine, you know, you need to know why it failed, you know, and you need to know what's going on. If it's a, if it's a tiny Cylon, you know, you know, it doesn't care. It's just going to go to the next mode. That's how I actually just reset them. Every time you hit the reset button, it just goes to the next mode. Um, and I wanted to talk about uh, one other topic real quick before I hand it off to Paul. And we're going to talk about some other topics. Um, the tool set that I outlined on here, um, I have a, a, an eight-page document that's also, it either is or is going to be shortly on available on the um, website that was used as the class notes for the class that I taught back in January. And it is step-by-step. Step. Here's how to download these files. Here's how to install them. Here's what to type in. Here's how to connect it to your program. Yeah, it's got Unix versions for the Unix. Or it Linux. also has that. It has the Windows version. Did you fix the Linux notes? Yes. And, uh, well, I, I fixed the typo, but I haven't actually fixed the permissions issue. So I still don't know how to do it. Um, there, I, I gave two different pathways using two different sets of tools. Um, but they both accomplish the same thing to where you can get back to this point where you type this in, hit compile, and program it to your chip. Okay, which is what everybody wants to do. Use the tool, put it into the chip. Um, since then, I have found another combination of tools works real well. The Eclipse IDE, which is a Java program, so it works on any platform and it looks exactly the same. It operates for the most part exactly the same way, uh, along with um, a plugin for the uh, Eclipse environment called the AVR Eclipse plugin. Uh, that understands how to uh, about the AVR tool set and also the programming uh, different programmers that are supported so it's literally it, it does everything that the AVR studio does I don't think it supports the uh, simulator uh, but other, it, but it might uh, I just have to look into that much I find that to be a better cross-platform um, solution it's also using only free tools, free as in open source tools, to where if you don't like the way it works, your source code, you go fix it. You are empowered. There are no proprietary trade secrets. There are no contracts. There are no licenses other than the, generally the GNU, uh, uh, the GPL. Uh, the Eclipse framework has its own complex license, but it's still basically it's a free project. It's an open source type project. Uh, I would like to have all that documented at some future time. I don't have it documented now. Uh, that will be the nature of any uh, further uh, lab classes that I teach, where I <coughs> you know, show you how to you know, connect your computer to the chip, make it blink, make it drive a servo, make it do whatever. It will be using the Eclipse tools. What, uh, why do you prefer the Eclipse tools? Well, they've come a long way. They actually work really well, and it provides an order of magnitude more um, uh, obfuscation. Well, <laughs> um, more useful tools for a developer than the AVR Studio does. Um, it does um, just a. Tr I mean, just even from being a text editor, it's much much better uh, as far as you know what all it allows you to do. Uh, it's much more of a you know a sophisticated programmer's environment. It also is set up to work on a collaborative uh, project works. Um, uh, it's it's much more with the times, you know, as far as what you get. And, and you know, these are all free tools, and they don't cost you anything. You don't spend any money. But um, I see it has a, a much brighter future because it has an unlimited developer pool Ooh, yeah. to to draw from. Um, Where's that? Mel is just one company. It's a big company, but you know they're not infinite uh, in their you know uh, capabilities or interest in supporting a particular product. They have a wide portfolio of chips that they sell. Um, so 
that being in mind, uh, questions? You might add that another advantage of that is that if you're, you're programming multiple different uh, microprocessors, the Eclipse, and using Eclipse as their IDE, uh, you'll have a common IDE, even though whether you might be using uh, TIS chips or AVR or some of the other Right, ones. it's cross-platform in the sense yeah. that cross Cross platform. Yeah. yeah, you usually have a, a you can, it supports many, many other uh, devices. Uh, uh, they can be plugged into, including native uh, Java development on your PC, which is what it was originally designed for. Uh, I use it for ARM development, you know, 32 bit ARM development as well, using the same. It's nice when you have the one tool to rule them all. Mm -hmm. uh, you can even do C on your PC if you plug the SIGWIN C. Yes, you can. Team, yeah. but I've done that. I, mean, I will you can never do that again. <laughs> Sigwin is a enigma wrapped in a riddle. <laughs> it messes it's not good. It's pretty bad. It's, it's, really I tried that one time and you said that. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it makes certain assumptions about what you're, what compromises you're willing to live with on your system. Um, because Windows is not. Sigwin is a compromise. That's the whole point. Yes. <laughs> well, it is a compromise. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. well, it, 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 it is. And it starts there and, and goes downhill rapidly and, and causes many, many issues. Uh, it's just like. No. Life's too short. Actually, I've got a 